Well, hello and welcome to a very special conversation with a phenomenal author, Min Jin Lee. She gave us free food for millionaires back in 2007. In 2017, she gave us the breathtaking Pachinko, which, by the way, Barack Obama says is on his list of must-read books for everyone. And so he's got great taste, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> Before we start, I have to take a moment to thank our venue sponsor, Victoria Theatre, and the session is made possible with the assistance of the U.S. Embassy, Singapore. So thank you very much, U.S. Embassy. How are you feeling, Min? You know, here in Singapore, uh, we spend about 2 hours 34 minutes binge-watching TV. The block is 2 hours 34 minutes, and I'm pretty sure most of it, we're watching K-pop and K-drama. <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely, don't you? It's... Korea is having a moment, right? It's I hope it's longer than a moment. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least two moments, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. But I want to take you back to when you were 19 and you started writing this book. You were a history major. You knew of Japan's colonization of Korea. But a guest lecture at a university makes you realize there is a part of the experience of Koreans in Japan that you were not aware of. So can you take us back to that moment and tell us how that sparked your interest in what would become Pachinko? So tomorrow I turn 51. <laughs> Happy birthday in advance! <laughs> it's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> um, at that point you were supposed to, th you know, never mind. <laughs> I heard no protests. <laughs> so. So this is a long time ago. When I was 19 years old, I was at university, and I wasn't a very good student. I was not. I didn't study very hard, and I was very lost. So I went to this lecture that because a friend of mine asked me to, and nobody wanted to go to this lecture because it was a history lecture about Korea in Japan. So nobody cared. So I went, and there was two of us. <laughs> Which means that there was the organizer, there was the presenter, and there was two of us. So there's four of us, an enormous plate of cookies, and I thought to myself, well, you know, it's not too bad. It's 45 minutes. How bad could it be? So I sit there. I was talking about the history of Koreans in Japan, of which I knew nothing about, and it's not taught anywhere. So if you've never heard of it, it's not your fault. And it was, I thought it was kind of boring, frankly. And then finally, he starts telling us about his parish. So the man was a Korean. He was a an American, a white American missionary doing nice things for Koreans in Japan. Like, he was like a good white guy. <laughs> I know. You didn't think that I was going to do that today, did you? <laughs> so, nice white guy. He's trying to help poor people. And he said that in his parish, he had a little boy who was 13 years old, who was ethnically Korean. And he had climbed up to his apartment building. And then he had um, jumped off to his death. And he was 13 years old, and his parents were also Korean, born in Japan, but ethnically Korean. And they had no idea why their son would do such a terrible thing. So they went through all of his things, and they found his middle school yearbook. And in his middle school yearbook, his Japanese classmates had written, go back to where you belong. I hate you. You smell like kimchi. And they wrote the words, die, die, die. And although this is over three decades ago, I remember that anecdote as perfectly as anything that I did this morning. And I think it's because it was so shocking to me. I think that's parts of your brain when something is so shocking, it has a different kind of memory function. And I couldn't figure out what to do with it. And I just sort of tucked it away and then I left and I went to law school. I had no idea I was gonna write anything about this. So, did you start writing the book in your early 20s? So, I was an attorney. So, I think here it's solicitor or barrister, right? So, I did it for until I was 25 years old, and it was very hard work. So, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, writing a novel would be so much easier. <laughs> and then it took me 12 years to publish my first book. And did it take 30 years to put Pachinko together? Yeah, because I started, I, I mean, I started thinking about it at 19, and I started reading a great deal about it, but then I really started to learn how to become a writer at age 25, because I worked on it. I've been working as a writer 
very seriously since age 25 as my primary thing. I mean, I wasn't paid, but I took it as seriously as I took being a lawyer, probably more so, significantly more so. So when I hold your book in my hands and I think it took 30 years to put this together, it feels like it's a work of art and you say it's going to be represented at the Biennale? Yeah, so right now if you go to the Venice Biennale, you will see the South Korean pavilion and the first line of Pachinko is actually the title for the South Korean government, which is history has failed us, but no matter. And I can't see it because I'm busy next week because I'm teaching. <laughs> but they sent me a t-shirt. <laughs> I'll always have that t-shirt. <laughs> it's tremendous. But yeah. Were there any doubts, because it took 30 years, were there any doubts that the investment, this is a huge chunk of your life, any doubts on your part whether the time you were putting into it was going to pay off? I don't really think of writing as a job, and it's not really a career. And I teach writing as a professor at America, and I always tell my students who are very talented and smart, I tell them it is not a job, it will never pay you enough money for what you do. So you do it because you want to and because you find gratification in the actual work. But it is not a job. And in that way, to answer your question, I don't think there's a payoff. I think that if people read it, that's an incredible gift to you. Because I'm going to tell you something most writers are too polite to say. <laughs> When I sell a copy of a book, I make about a dollar. About a dollar. Yeah. So the paperback, if you purchase one, I will net maybe a dollar, a dollar nineteen, depending upon how many I sell. So like after a hundred or hundred and fifty copies, you make, let's say, marginally more. So if you th and I and I say this to you because I have so certain socialist tendencies. <laughs> 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 and that requires transparency. <laughs> but also just to say, you'd have to be stupid to want to be a writer as a job. And I'm a little stupid. <laughs> oh no, definitely not. Has, who's here, who here has read Pachinko? Wow, look at that. That's the number of people Thank you touched. Thank you. No, my mother thanks room. you, my editor thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> my agent thanks you, my ancestors thank you. <laughs> Well, it's not just us in this room. Apple TV Plus has purchased the rights for a television adaptation of Pachinko. So how's that coming along? And will you be involved in key decisions? No, no. <laughs> no, no, I, writers are kind of like cockroaches in Hollywood. No, truly. And as a matter of fact, I recently went to a panel about adaptations from TV writers at the New Yorker Festival. So I had a panel at the New Yorker Festival and then I went to this panel for adaptations for the New Yorker Festival by TV writers. And they were talking about people who create IP, intellectual property, that's people like me. Um, and their wish is kind of like that we're dead. <laughs> because what they want to do is they want to do whatever they want. And that's okay. Like, I think that if they depart from the book, there's very little I could do about it. So I, I have no power right now. So you have no fear about representation? Oh, no, I have a lot of fear. <laughs> 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 but I didn't know any of this because in a million years, I would have never thought that my book could be on television. So I remember they sent me the sign and they kind of hustled me to you know, sign it and I figured, and it's actually not much money. So... And, and I can't reveal it because I think I was told I'd get sued. So anyway, but the good news is that it's going to happen, I guess, but then I am afraid that, you know, it could be horrendous. Well, we'll be binge watching it for sure. Yeah, I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you like it. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> now, you said in an interview, I did not intend to write a historical novel when talking about Pachinko. I did intend to tell the truth have you always been a fan of historical fiction? Did you end up writing the kind of book that you would love to read? Well, I really like 19th century epic novels. So I thought that I would try to write that. Why not? So I did that, but it didn't, like, I didn't know what a historical novel was. Like I kind of thought, okay, well I kind of like Marquez, but he's not my favorite. 
Like, I don't really like ghosts and books. And think <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, I like Allende, again, fantastic, but it's not my kind of thing. I'm, I really like realistic fiction. I like social novels, so I like Tolstoy. I like Dickens. I like George Eliot as my favorite. You know, these are very solid 19th century omniscient narrations. So then I figured, yeah, I'm just going to go for that. But no, I didn't intend to. But now that I ended up writing one, I'll never do it again. <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> like, if you want a sequel, ask another girl. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It takes forever. I mean, I could be 80 by the time you see it. <laughs> So you've said that you approach Pachinko like a journalist, right? Mm -hmm. You were interviewing, you were reading oral histories. How did you make sure that historical fact didn't overwhelm your imaginative storytelling? You know, the, I, this is really easy to answer because I, I messed it up so badly the first time. So I wrote an entire novel called Motherland, which was based on the story that I had heard when I was 19. And it was a real novel. It was just really terrible. And I'm not being modest. Like, I'm not, I'm not a very modest person. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you if I'm good at something, and that just, like, sucked eggs. So, and it was really bad because it was all accurate. It was really accurate. It's based on probably the most thorough and comprehensive academic research because I'm a very serious researcher and a journalist in, in the way I approach things. But it was very angry. And no one wants to read a really angry novel. So after I wrote it, I read it like a reader, and I thought, oh, this is really bad. No one's going to want to read this shit. So I didn't send it out. And at that point, I was really depressed. And I was really sick with this liver disease that I used to have. And I, did, I didn't even send it out. So I just want to pick up on that point of it being too angry. Because mm -hmm. you know, when the subject matter is injustice, um, prejudices leveled at Koreans by Japanese, even reading what we read in Pachinko, it's hard not to be angry. So why did you make that call? What was too angry? Well, it's one thing if I let you have the feelings, but I can't have that feeling of kind of an ax to grind. Because you, then you feel like you're being condescended to, like I'm telling you something is wrong. I mean, you, all of you know when something is wrong. And I think that I have come to really respect the reader in a different kind of way after having written so many like drafts. Like I think readers are incredibly smart and if you try to mess with them, they will just close that book and they will turn on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't blame you. Like I judge a lot of awards. Like Michelle and I were talking in the back in the dark. It's dark back there. <laughs> and we were having a really good time actually. <laughs> and we were talking about how we judge things all the time at prizes and the ability to sustain our attention when we have so many books to read. And I think in a way it's kind of a good test because I want you to want to read that book. Not that you have to, you have to read the book, like you have to eat spinach. I think it should kind of go down like a chocolate shake. Even though it's really important, the ideas. And I think learning how to know that story, the story that's very important and worth my time, and it should be really engaging. I think it should be entertaining. I think work, literature should be entertaining. And the books that I love to read are important, but they're also great. I want to read them, and I want to recommend them. I want to stop people and say, have you read Madame Bovary? Emma is such an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but she has sex in a car. <laughs> she does. She actually, it's a horse carriage, but you know. You need your own Netflix special. I had no idea you were so funny. Don't you think? <laughs> no, it's very funny because I don't think I'm funny. I think I'm really awkward. And you're actually laughing at me. <laughs> but I've worked around it. I've had a lot of therapy. It's okay. I wonder if you will perform a little for us. I wonder if you will read a little for us. Sure. Um, so I think maybe for this forum, maybe I should read the pachinko part. OK. So I'm going to read for two minutes. Two minutes. I want to read for two minutes because I really want you to like me. <laughs> and I think readers who read too long are self-indulgent. 
don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> okay, so this is the very beginning of the book, not the very, very beginning, but early part. It's March of 1933. We're at the Busan Ferry Terminal, where Young Jin, the mother, is saying goodbye to her pregnant daughter, Sanja, who is our protagonist. And she's about to leave for Japan with her husband, Ishak. And Sanja's pregnant with another man's child. Two minutes, it's shorter than a YouTube video. Okay. I saw the gold watch in your things, Young Jin said. Was it from that man? Yes. What kind of man can afford something like that? And Sanja didn't reply. Where is the man who gave you the watch? He lives in Osaka. But that's where you're going. Are you planning to see him? No. You cannot see this man, Sanja. He abandoned you. He is not good. And Yangjin took her daughter's hand. You cannot see him. That man. That man, Young Jin pointed at Ishak, who was still talking to the immigration officers, that man saved your life. He saved your child, and you're a member of his family. I have no right to see you again. Do you know what that's like for a mother? Soon, you'll be a mother, and I hope you'll have a son who won't have to leave you when he marries. And Sanja nodded. The watch. What will you do with it? I'll sell it when I get to Osaka. Young Jin was satisfied with that answer. Save it for an emergency. If your husband asks where you got it, tell him that I gave it to you. And Young Jin fumbled with the purse tucked beneath her blouse. This belonged to your father's mother. And Young Jin gave her the two gold rings that her mother-in-law had given to her before she died. Try not to sell it unless you have to. You should have something in case you need money. You're a thrifty girl, but raising a child requires money. There will be things you can't expect like doctor's visits. And if it's a boy, you'll need fees for school. And if your husband doesn't give you money for the household, earn something. And put aside savings for emergencies. Spend what you need, but just throw even a few coins into a tin and forget that you have it. A woman should always have something set by. And take good care of your husband. Otherwise, another woman will. Treat your husband's family with reverence. Obey them. And if you make mistakes, they will curse our family. Think of your kind father, who always did his best for us. And Yang Jin tried to think of anything else that she was supposed to tell her, but it was so hard to focus. Sanja slipped the rings into the fabric bag beneath her blouse where she kept her watch and money. Amani, I'm sorry. I know, I know. And Young Jin closed her mouth and she stroked Sanja's hair. You're all I have. And now I have nothing. A round of applause.
That was amazing. That was incredible. A woman at the market tells Sanja, a woman's life is endless work and suffering. Always expect suffering and keep working hard. No one will take care of a poor woman, just ourselves. When you were characterizing female characters, what did you hold as important? I kept listening to the voices of the women who talked to me. And all the interviews that I had, women who are older, considerably older, kept on telling me how much I should expect suffering. Me, like they're adorable. They're like, you are too sensitive. <laughs> and you're too upset about this issue. And I think their attitude was, you have to expect suffering. It's just part of life and all women must suffer. And they tried to explain it to me like, you know, when you get your period, you, your body suffers as a young girl. And then from that moment on, if you don't marry the right man, you're going to suffer and your life will be determined by your uterus. That was pretty much what I heard. And I thought, that is so fucked up. I mean, really? And I'm an American woman. I'm a lawyer. And I keep thinking, like, well, I wouldn't have, I'm, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. And then I, it occurred to me, in some ways, women really do have a different experience. Like, I think men suffer a lot, too. So it's kind of, you know, just a silly way to think about things, in a way. However, I think in very patriarchal cultures, when women don't have many rights, then I think that they're saying this out of concern. And I put it in the book because they said so. And it's a survival strategy. Uh, completely. OK, let's kick things up a little. Are you ready for speed round? OK. OK, let's go for speed <laughs> round. Here we go. Off the top of your head, uh, what is a recent book that you've read that you enjoy? Oh, I love Dutch House by Ann Patchett. Love Ann Patchett. If you could write any other genre, what would it be? I'd love to impress my son. Who is here, by the way. Who is here, by the way. So I think that in a way, I'd love to write really good screenplays, mm. like, like for action films. <laughs> <laughs> and in order to impress my son, I've actually taken a look at these things. And I keep thinking, they're 120 pages, and it's like triple space. How hard could it be? <laughs> <laughs> but it's really hard, actually, because you can't put in any motivation. Everything has to be visual. So I don't know if it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> if you were not a writer, what would you be doing? Oh. Don't say lawyer. If you're not a writer or a lawyer. Oh, actually, as a child, I wanted to be a carpenter. Oh. I wanted to learn how to make furniture. Mm. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what are the first three words that come to mind in response to... This word, Singapore. Chili crab. <laughs> Laksa. <That's four> <laughs> <laughs> Chicken rice. It's actually more Well done, well done. This is sort of a, we love that. Yeah. Best advice you've ever received on writing? Oh, that's easy. Choose the important over the urgent. And that's a life advice, but it's also very, very good for fiction. Choose the important over the urgent. So you kind of think, oh, I have to do something. I feel like I have to put something in there. But if you really think about what's important to your story, then you will change your everything and focus on that. It's very good editing advice, too. Hmm. Also, it's very good advice for dating. <laughs> <laughs> in the age of Tinder, think about it. <laughs> I had no idea of Pachinko the adult gambling game was so important for revenue to Japan and that it, for business or employment for Koreans, historically it's been impo an important sector. How did, the, how did the title come to you? Well, I did all these interviews in Japan. I had no idea I was going to call the book Pachinko because it was initially Motherland. Because, you know, that kind of makes sense, right? Like you lose your home and what's your motherland? And that metaphysical question was something that I had in my head. And then as I interviewed every single Korean Japanese person had someone in his or her family who was involved in pachinko in some way, like an uncle, a cousin, a father, a mother, something. And I thought, what is this thing? And then I started interviewing all these people who worked in pachinko parlors. I actually went inside pachinko parlors. I even counted money in the back. I fixed machines. I did all of that stuff. I mean, I really understand that business now. And I realized, oh, it's totally a rigged game. Like in the way, if you go to the casino tonight, you'll most likely lose money. Like some of you might win, but most of you will lose money because a house always wins. And if you think about that, why do you play that game? 
You play because you feel like you have to. And life is like that. Life, in many ways, is incredibly unfair. It is rigged. I mean, certain parts of life are really rigged. And yet you play. And I thought about, I wanted to celebrate the human spirit. I wanted to celebrate ordinary people who still have to face really unfair situations, and yet they still persist. And I think that's kind of beautiful. It is, it's a beautiful metaphor. And the book shows us how people are, strive for dignity in an environment where it's relentless, the prejudice, the oppression that comes at them. I'm just wondering, how has Pachinko been received over in Japan? Funny you ask. Um, well, the Korean Japanese who have read it have read it in either Korean or they have read it in English. It has been purchased by a very famous prestigious publisher two years ago. It has not yet been released. I've been told that it will be released at the end of the year. So we'll see. Yeah, I'll let you know. Okay, keep, keep us posted. You took three decades to write Pachinko, and so much change has happened. Uh, today is the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, a moment that led to the Cold War ending and a reunited Germany. So, so much change over in Europe across this time. You were just beginning to write Pachinko when the wall fell. So today, would you say there are cracks in the virtual walls of discrimination and history that separates Koreans from Japanese and Korea from Japan? I want to say yes. I want to say yes because one of the things that I like, and I've been very fortunate because there's 30 languages of Pachinko right now in terms of translation, so I've been able to go around the world, and I really love Generation Z. And the young people right now really inspire me because they are so progressive and thoughtful and deeply fair. So I really like these young people, they're awesome. However, the young people can't do anything structurally important unless they're taught the truth. And unfortunately, in our curriculums, our history books are still shit. So what can we do? And also, very often, teachers can't give the kids true resources. They're hamstrung by organizations and governments. So the Japanese children who I have met, who I think are really lovely, have no idea that this is going on. I've met so many lovely Japanese people who have said to me, I didn't know. If you go to the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo, it actually says the Americans started the war. Go, look at it. It says it in English. They really see Americans as the aggressor for World War II. So you can't blame young people if they don't know the truth. So I don't see how it's going to change. Okay, time for you to meet some of the young people here. I see a lot of young readers, and I'm sure some of you have some great questions. So, first question from men from the crowd, anybody? Yep, hand going up there. Just shout, we can hear you. Oh, what's your name? Lillian. Lillian? It's a pleasure to meet you. You sound like an American. There you go. <laughs> so Lillian's question, I believe, is about how does ancestry affect the way I, how does ancestry affect my writing, and then also because I'm Korean American, how would that affect my perception? I think one of the cool things about the way I work is that I realize that there are so many parts of me that affect the way I have a filter around the world. And as, as I said earlier, my first book was really horrible because I was so angry. And the, the first version of this book. And I was really angry, I think, because I grew up in America. I grew up in America as an immigrant, and I also grew up in America as an immigrant in a very magical place called Queens, New York. And the reason Queens, New York is a very magical place is because it has the highest number of immigrants even today around the world. And because you have the sort of density of immigrants and a variety in a multiracial, multicultural environment in which I felt very loved and welcomed, I can see inequity and say that's not the way things should be. And I think that for me, when I heard the story as a young person, it made me really angry, not because I had the knowledge, but because I knew that didn't feel right. 
And of course, when I went to law school, I became even more pissed because lawyers are always angry about stuff. <laughs> but then it created a bad novel to have that sort of agenda. But in terms of asking about ancestors, I really love my family. I really adore my parents and also my grandparents. I'm very proud of my history. My grandfather was a Presbyterian minister and he was the headmaster of an orphanage that took and repatriated Korean children from Japan after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I feel like as a Christian, there are many horrible Christians out there, but I felt like he did something good. So I'm very proud of his history. So when I say that to you, again, I'm saying something that happened in South Korea, but also as a Korean American, both those aspects affect the way I look at the world. And I like that. In the same way as a feminist, I feel very strongly affected by the belief that women have equal rights and they should have equal rights. So I couldn't take away any aspect of my personality because if I only make a dollar per book, I might as well say the things I want to say. <laughs> Yes, another question up front. Go ahead. I found your book fascinating. I found your book fascinating. What's Thank your you name? Very much. My name is Gordon. Gordon, hey. I actually lived in Japan for uh, a number of years, but I spent two years in Shinokobo, which is uh, affectionately known as Koreatown. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, I was working at a uh, uh, kindergarten, international kindergarten that was owned by an uh, older gentleman who was Korean who had made his fortunes there as a pachinko parlor owner. So I got to observe, of course, but not experience the Korean experience in Japan. And in Shinokobo especially, I saw this shifting um, development where it becomes almost theme parkish now, where mm -hmm. there's this love of Japanese, uh, Jap love of Korean culture, of the K-pop and so on. And yet at the same time, there's a dichotomy because it still very much sort of has that you know, uh, dumping ground feel. And I remember reading at the same time an article about a Korean politician who was born there who couldn't get citizenship even though she was born and had worked and was a popular politician so could never run. Do you continue to follow the sort of Korean experience in Japan? Do you plan to follow up with an essay? And you talked about your, uh, the, the Apple TV series. Would you like to see that continue the Sega on uh, from 1989 where your book ends? Oh, so Gordon's question is about how the Koreans in Japan experience life today. And unfortunately, I think even though we have soft power and soft culture rising with the interest in K-pop, and I'm very happy for BTS, truly. <laughs> like, I actually bought a suit recently, and I kind of thought, it kind of is BTS-y. <laughs> And I, I think that's sort of pathetic because I'm 51, but whatever. <laughs> um, so I'm affected by this. That said, saying that because we have an interest in K-drama or K-pop, and I know you're not saying this, because that's rising in the world that somehow South Koreans are understood is a preposterous idea. It's kind of like saying, I like jazz and therefore we're going to deny the fact that black lives matter and young black people are being shot in America right now just because they're walking in the streets. Both things are true. You can love hip hop and think and realize the artistry and beauty of hip hop and yet you can also realize that there's police brutality in the streets of America today, right? So unfortunately, Koreans in Japan today are deeply discriminated against just even having their own name is considered a political act. Like, if I say my name is Min Jin Lee, I don't think anybody in America is going to be mad at me except for the fact that it's, it seems foreign. But they don't necessarily think I'm somehow dirty or criminal or untrustworthy or too competitive because I'm Korean. And I gave you those negative connotations of personality because that is what Koreans are seeing today that they somehow all support North Korea, a dangerous country in their minds. And that's really, really troubling to me. But to answer your question, will I continue that with an essay? I do speak about it when asked, but my next book is 
uh, called American, my next novel is called American Hogwan, and the reason why I'm in Singapore is because I'm researching Singapore, because it's going to be a tiny part of the book. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> you are now being scrutinized. <laughs> by a silly writer. <laughs> Don't worry about it, it's good. I, I'm trying to figure out the tuition centers in Singapore right now. Yeah, I know. I went to learning labs yesterday, holy shit. <laughs> you guys know how to do tuition centers. <laughs> um, and my, next, uh, and my next book is actually, it's a memoir and it's called Name Recognition and it's about the memoir of visibility and voice and it's about how Asians are seen around the world and how I tried to become, I tried to overcome learning how to speak and also about being visible. But I do think Gordon's point is so important because I could laugh about it, but I do follow it because I am trying to understand what it means to be Korean around the world because I studied diaspora. And I think especially for a country like Singapore in which we have a multiracial, multicultural experience. And it's been so, for the most part, so deeply respected by, by law. And I think that in that sense, it's, it's quite an anomaly around the world. So I really, that's why I wanted to look at Singapore, it's education in, in addition to the fact that you have a multicultural, multiracial society. Do we have another question from the floor? Yes, so many, you sir in the yellow. Well, you can just shout it, we can hear you, yeah. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, wait. Uh oh. Okay, hold on. For that, we need the so mic sorry. so everybody can hear this reductive comment of yours. Hold on. Go ahead, reduce go. me. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so when I read Pachenko, it reminded me of... Okay, when I first read Jane Austen, I always wondered, what would Jane Austen look like today? And when I read Pachenko, that it reminded me of, this is what Jane Austen could be today. Wow. And I'm just wondering, did you ever think of it that way? Or... Were you inspired by Jane Austen? <laughs> you know Eugene, it's Eugene. Yes. I was so afraid that you were going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> and I was bracing myself like, he said reductive. <laughs> so I was really worried. But that's incredibly kind and generous and flattering because Jane Austen is obviously one of the great writers of English novels and I really love her work because she's also incredibly comic. Like her intelligence is so comic and I'm not, and my work is actually not comic at all. I'm probably the most cheerful, depressed person you're ever gonna meet. <laughs> so, and I do that because I keep thinking about the fact that no one wants to hear my sad stories, but in my work, you will see how much I struggle with sadness and also how much I try to create meaning out of the tragedies of life. Because I do think that the world is unfair. And sometimes if you talk to me for a while, you'll think, wow, she's only talking about negative stuff. <laughs> And I think it's because, for me, I don't know if you've ever seen a mourning card, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Like, if you see a, a piece of stationery for mourning, it's after somebody passes away and you're supposed to thank them or send your condolences. It's usually a blank card and kind of a cream colored, and the edges are bordered in black. And I think, for me, life is like that. Like, I do see this sort of blank, but I, I do see this border of black because even though I'm really happy at this moment, here I am talking to a really cool person and you guys all showed up, thank you so much. At the same time, like, I know that there's poverty, there's overwhelming poverty and inequity and hatred in this world. So I always kind of think, well, what can I do to balance this? Because I don't want to just focus on the evil. I really want to focus on the fact that all of us are readers and readers, I think, are holding up civilization truly. I don't think it's writers, I think it's readers. So, because I think we, because even if all writers stop today, there's still some very good books out there. And that makes me really happy, because before I was a writer, I was really a reader, and I'm still a reader right now, and that gives me such consolation, and it makes me feel less lonely in the world. But would Jane Austen think that I would be somehow related to her? Probably not. <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> like, I love Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, 
And sometimes it humors me because I kind of think, would Charlotte Bronte have thought that I cared so much about this little orphan? And I don't know. But that's the cool thing about writing, is that you don't know who your reader is going to be. Like, I just got a letter yesterday from a young man in, from Iran. In a million years, I wouldn't have thought that, that a young man in Iran would be deeply mo moved by somebody who's Korean Japanese. And when I wrote my first book, I had an older white gentleman write me from Albany, New York, saying, I'm Casey Hahn. I was like, OK. <laughs> So you are. <laughs> and I felt really happy because I think we readers cross borders all the time, and that gives me hope. It really, really gives me hope that you and I, Eugene, Eugene and I can feel connected like brothers. And you'll see when I sign books, I usually write, we are family. And for me, I write that because I have to believe that somehow we can be brothers and sisters. Otherwise, there's really no hope. So, thank you. Great question, great. Listen, I just realized there are people up there as well. We've spilled over. So, I want to give you guys a chance to ask a question as well. So, shoot. Yes, woman in the front row. Hand went up first. Let's hear from you. Um, Minjin, I really enjoyed your book, Pachinko. Thank you. um, I lived in New York for a little bit. And, um, yeah, it's kind of cool that you grew up in Queens. Um, my question is about the people you interviewed in order to do this book. Um, how did they feel about how you've portrayed the issue? Um, like, is there something that, is there an agenda that they had when they spoke to you that they wanted you to bring out in, in terms of their voice? And do they feel like you've done that justice? Or, you know, was that not anything that they wanted out of giving you these interviews? Where are you? Okay. <laughs> What's your name? Um, my name is Seema. Seema, how are you? Good, thank you. <laughs> is it S-E-E-M-A? That is correct. What does that mean? Oh, uh, literally border, like between two countries. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you came to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love Seema's question because I teach writing and I try to encourage my students to go out and talk to people and above all to listen to people because I could have a wish and above all, I could have a wish for what I want Seema to say, but the best thing would be is Seema surprised me. And I think that as a writer and also as a writer of books that weren't contractually obligated. Like, I work on spec mostly. So, uh, so my next book is gonna come out and that's the first book I've ever sold before it was entirely done. Which means that I have to be entertained with what I, what I ask. So if Seema, I took you to lunch and said, hey, can we talk about your experience in living in Singapore? And let's say, do you mind if I ask you what you, your profession is? You're a stockbroker, perfect. So let's say you sell institutional equities or let's say you're a private retail broker and I wanted to meet what, and I wanted to hear what you did for a living and also what kind of equities that you sell, who your clients are. So let's we talk for about an hour and then it turns out that you really, really love your job because you have made a lot of poor widows rich. Most likely people didn't expect that to happen. And I think that the, the possibility of being surprised is wonderful for a fiction writer because then I could change my plot. So most of Pachinko happened because my interviewees have surprised me. But your question goes to do they have an agenda? They could, but usually if you spend about an hour and a half with me, you realize that that doesn't help because I don't really care about your agenda. What I really care is the fact that you have an agenda. So if you have an agenda, that's fine with me. It's not that you couldn't persuade me. It's that I think it's interesting that you want to persuade me. So then I take my notes, and I never record anybody on audio. I never videotape them. And if I need a translator, I'll hire a translator. And mostly I kind of like figure out, why did you wear a red skirt? I'm interested in how you take your coffee. I really am. I wonder why you touch your hair when you speak. 
So all those kinds of things are very important material for a fiction writer. So in that sense, I'm not, the, thing that's, the things that I'm looking for don't make that much sense. So you could have all the agendas, but I'm going to take about 2% of it. And very often what I really look for is the surprise element. So thank you. Thanks. So many questions up there. OK, th that one with the two hands up. Yes. Really wants to ask a question. <laughs> two hands. Thank you for, for seeing that. Um, my name is Hazira. I'm here. Yeah, right on top. Oh, sorry. Ooh. Hi. My name is Hazira, and I'm, I'm Singaporean. And I just wanted to let you know that your book actually helped a friend through a grieving process. So I had read it, and I did the thing you did, where you have to read this. Oh my God, stop everything you're doing, right? Oh, read this. And it helped you. my friend grieve through a grieving process. So thank you for the book, really. Thank and my, next, my actual question is, um, I know you write about a very particular form of, or a form of discrimination that's very particular to Koreans in Japan. But do you anticipate that the experience of um, discrimination could be universal? That means, for, the, for example, I am a minority in this country, and I know just now you mentioned about going to the learning lab and how multiracialism and multiculturalism seems to be enshrined in law. But for those of us who are minorities in this country, we also still, and one of the ways in which racism in Singapore manifests, racism and class, is through the education system. So. I wonder if you, when writing about a specific experience, you, you thought about how it could be general, general in terms of how people experience discrimination. Thank you. Hazira? Yep. All right. So it's a pleasure to meet you. And I like your question very much because I think when we think about discrimination, we often think of something that happens to minorities and to people who are marginalized. And as a person who is marginalized, and especially when I was growing up, I grew up working class. My parents had a newspaper kiosk, and in that environment, beyond just economic poverty and economic um, inequality, one of the things that I had an issue with is I couldn't talk in public, so I suffered from a lot of anxiety and alienation. And I think that the aspect of universalism, a lot of it has to do with empathy and all of us are capable of feeling empathy for those who feel outside because all of us have been marginalized in some way or another. Being a statistical minority and a racial or ethnic or cultural minority is a very specific experience. And I only write about groups that I feel deeply personally connected to and I feel somewhat entitled to write about. For the most part, I stay in my lane. But I've noticed that if I do stay in my lane for the most part, and if I, and if I don't, I, I do an enormous amount of research to cover my deficits. And also, I always talk to people within those groups. I've noticed that if I'm really particular, then people outside those groups can find connections with them. Human beings, we're quite empathetic people. And as a matter of fact, I think it's quite learned to otherize groups. So I do feel a great deal of hope in terms of individuals and smaller communities. I am disappointed with the rise of leaders around the world in advanced economies who wish to shut smaller groups out or people who have need. Right now, I believe at last count when I checked, there are almost 65 million displaced people around the world who have no homes. These are refugees and displaced people who are moving and crossing borders and nobody wants them. Nobody. I know Singapore doesn't want them. The United States doesn't want them. Europe doesn't want them, right? These are very wealthy countries and I look at that very seriously. So although, but I will say something that's interesting about Singapore, there are quotas here like in America, quotas are technically considered illegal. They're de facto considered bad things. And I have come to believe that quotas are good things because I don't know if you can make people who are in power give up their power just because they're generous. So in a way, I think you kind of have to force people to take new people on, not because you feel sorry for them, but because perhaps they're more talented. So there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for a few more questions, so okay. Lady in front, right here, second row. Hi, 
Hi, um, Jenny Faith. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if my question is appropriate, but it's more to do with the last chapter of the book. I'm actually a writer myself. I co-author a novel for a few years with my co-author here, who is a medical doctor. Um, but we are writing like contemporary fiction. So I kind of like, as, as a writer, I read a lot as to study as well. So I'm very interested in the introdu introduction of characters. And I noticed that in the last chapter, a new character was introduced. And I just wonder, want to know, like, Mm, is there a significance to introduce this character, which is the groundskeeper, um, Ichi Ichida-san? I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly. So that's like my first question, the significance of this character on a very important chapter. Thank you. And I think we'll keep it at that because okay. we're coming close to end time. Go ahead. Um, sorry, sorry. My second question will be about oh, I, th I think I think we'll, we'll stick to <laughs> no, one question I, 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 first. Okay, okay. Did you give us your name as well? Uh, no, uh, my name is Jenny Faith, but my second question is about faith. So I was okay. wondering. I, I think we'll keep it to one question because we have to wrap up at five, but go ahead. So, Jenny Faith's question is about introducing new characters toward the end of the book. So, Ichida san for me is very important, and I don't want to give any spoilers. Uh, but I will say that sometimes people don't like it when you have newer characters toward the end. However, I write omniscient novels, which means that my worlds are very, very populated, and I write big community books. And one of the things that I've noticed in my life is that although I'm the through line of my biography, like this moment is deeply affected by Michelle Martin, right? She's a new person in my life, and however, at this moment, nothing would happen unless Michelle was here. So to not include Michelle in talking about this moment would be kind of stupid. So I don't have big hard and fast rules, obviously. I, so for example, would I include Michelle Martin if I was writing a story about my cooking life? Probably not. But if I was talking about going on book tour in Singapore, to not include Michelle Martin would be almost a crime. So you have to ask yourself, what's your story? So in my story, it's very important that I include Ichida-san because he is a Japanese person who is interacting with a Korean Japanese person in a very compassionate way. And I wanted to show his level of compassion. Okay, you know what? We are out of time. You are as captivating as your books. Ladies and gentlemen, Min Jin Lee. And by the way, fabulous, fabulous. Uh, Min is going to be signing books outside, so if you have more questions, you can head outside. And National Library Board um, has allowed everybody access to the ebook for free. So if you like what you heard about Pachinko, go ahead and borrow the book. You have till the 24th of November. I'm Michelle Martin. Thank you so much. <laughs>